Good afternoon. I would like for you to just take one moment and close your eyes. And I want for you to think that while you've been here today enjoying some really great topics, that when you get home, someone has gone into your house and they have ransacked everything that you have. They have destroyed your, your everyday living space and they have taken your things. They have violated your personal space. And the first thing that you are going to do is call the police. And when the police come, they come to rescue you, but when they open the door, they look at you and you show them all that has happened in your home, and they turn you around and they put you in cuffs. They put you in the back of the cop car and they take you to jail. And while you're still confused and you're wondering what's really going on, no one really tells you what's going on. They just put you in a cell. And after you've been there for some time, I walk into your cell and I sit next to you and I tell you that you have been a victim of a crime. I'm sorry that happened to you. You have been burglarized and let me get you the help that you need. Open your eyes because historically that is what we have done to young people who have been caught up in child sex trafficking. That is what we have done to young people who have been abused by adults who are supposed to protect them and keep them safe. So today I would like to talk about something and child sex trafficking in an arena in a different way than what you've seen it before. I assume that most of you with the awareness that have, has taken place locally and nationally, that you've heard about trafficking. You know it exists. You heard whether you saw it on the news, whether you heard it on an NPR news story. You know that trafficking doesn't just happen somewhere else and that it's a little bit closer to home than you might think. But one of the things that, that you don't know is that there's a whole journey that someone faces before they end up at the hands of a trafficker. There's a whole journey that young people face because the average age of entry into child sex trafficking is 12 to 14 years old. Today, I want to talk to you and let, make sure that while you hear about all these stories on the news, and if you're a newbie and you haven't heard about it, then I'm sure you've seen the movie Taken. I'm sure you've watched an SVU episode and you wonder, is this how it truly happens? Is this all that there is? But while you do have those really heinous cases, there are... Um, there, there is a huge co a continuum of abuse in which this tends to happen. And we live in a culture and a society that make it okay that we can live in a world where a young boy or a young girl can be sold for sex. So what I want to do, and one of the main things that I want to talk about in regards to trafficking is not that, just, that it just happens, but as everyday people, as every human person, we can be a part of ending this and we can be a part of it by preventing it. Now, prevention is a very scary word because how can you prove that you prevented something that never happened? That is the thought that I oftentimes wonder about when I work with the girls in our program. But what I really want to do is not just talk about trafficking because we know it happens. It has already broken our heart. It is what got me on this platform today. We know that there are young girls and young boys who are bought and sold at the hands of adults who take advantage of them. We know it. We know that they are bought and sold um, for labor servitude as well. We know that human trafficking exists. But what I want to talk about today is how did we end up in a world where, where it exists and that it is okay that people like us sit in this room and we hear about these topics, but there are girls miles and miles close to here and near from here that have no clue that there are people talking about them because they don't self-identify as a victim. So um, I, it's been told to me before that prostitution is the oldest form um, of work. You've seen it before. It's, it's just something that's going to happen. You're never going to end it in our time. But if, if you really understand this, it's, it's the oldest profession in the world. Trade and farming is the oldest profession in the world. It's not prostitution because it was documented. So I want to give you just two seconds of information on the actual problem in itself. We don't just talk about this issue and talk about the girls and the young boys who are caught up in this because we have to look at this as, as an economic issue. And if you look at it as an economic issue, you understand that if the demand for a product goes down, the supply will go down as well. So when we talk about this issue, the first thing that comes to your mind is tell me about those girls. Tell me where they are. Tell me where they come from. But it's not just the girls that we have to talk about. Because if there was no person that wanted to sell that girl or that young boy, then no one would be able to buy them. 
So we cannot talk about the true issue of trafficking if we cannot talk about those who perpetuate the problem, and that is the demand side as well. You've probably seen on the news that, that pimps are getting records amount of time right now if, if they, if, when they're caught. But how often do you hear that someone who has purchased sex with a minor is in jail for the same amount of time that the pimp has gone to jail? How many of times have you told, oh, he's just being a man? But what I want to talk about today is how we can both look on both sides of the issue at the supply side, which unfortunately are our children. We talk a lot about girls, but it happens to boys as well, if not as much. But we don't have clear numbers on that. But I also want to talk about what prevention looks like on the demand side. Because pe people are really starting to believe that this is something that is never going to end in our lifetime. I disagree, because I really believe that prevention is the true protection. So while we recognize that between no one wakes up at 16 or 18 years old and decide today is the day that I'm going to be a prostitute. Just doesn't happen like that. People get caught up in the who, what, when, where, and how and not really into let's see how we can live in a world where this doesn't exist. People tell me all the time, tell me where they come from. Is it those poor little black girls over there on the corner? I know that's a downtown problem. I know that's a south side problem. Well, it's an everybody problem. It's a Georgia problem. We recognize that no child wakes up on their 18th birthday or on their 21st birthday and they decide, today is the day I give up, I'm not paying my light bill, drop me off on the corner because I'm ready to turn a trick. You don't wake up with that thought in your mind one day because there's been a process that has allowed you to be vulnerable to those very people who, have, who are seeking to exploit you. So while we recognize that the average age of entry into prostitution is 12 to 14 years old, we also recognize that about 50% of the victims that we know have a history of run runaway. There is about 80% of victims that we know that have a history of sexual abuse. And knowing these, why aren't we fully addressing those issues? Why are we choosing to wait until they're at the point of rescue? When you hear that word rescue, doesn't it make you feel like something substantial has happened? Doesn't it make you feel like you have swooped in and you've saved someone, you've given them a better way? But what is it about? prevention that we don't understand in that same format. Now, when we talk about the girls, and I can tell you that when we say girls a lot, but it happens to boys as well, let's talk about the demand side of that. Right now in Georgia, we, understand, we recognize that the Georgia demand study shows that 7,200 men, knowingly or unknowingly, purchase sex from adolescent girls each month here in Georgia. 42% of that give their location of north of 285. That can help us realize that this is not a problem that belongs. And I'll just go ahead and be the one to say it. People are pimped by their own. I wish I can tell you that there is this one single uh, mathematic equation that can help us end this, but it is, you have to break down and dispel what you think you know about trafficking. And trafficking happens in every single community, every single culture, it just looks differently. Now, a young black boy is not gonna work into an a walk into an Asian parlor and pimp out all their girls. It's not going to happen. A young white guy is not going to walk in the hood and pimp out all the black girls. It's just not going to happen. So I'd love to be able to tell you that I can give a name and a face to all of these so that we can go and rescue them all, but I can't. What I want to do today is share with you the idea of let's address what happens on the journey before they are actually trafficked. Let's look at how we can choose to prevent them because what happens and what we know right now here in Georgia is that if a girl is rescued or a child is rescued, it's going to take about $5,600 a month for residential treatment services for that child. $5,600. But I know from working with the girls in Youth Spark Voices, which is Georgia's first prevention program aimed at preventing and reaching those girls who are in that grooming phase, who are not there yet, but yet they are headed down that road, it only takes about $3,000 a year for one girl. Why are we paying $5,600 a month versus $3,000 a year? Because we don't understand the journey that they face, and what I want to do is give us a chance to really look at that. Now, Look at this diagram. I would have loved to have something prettier for you, but the laws of creative commons scare me. And so I don't want, I was too afraid to pull one of the beautiful ones off of the internet. But when you look at this, you see the tip of an iceberg. It's jagged and you can make assumptions about what you think you know about this rock. But I want you to compare this to the children who are trafficked by adults. Now, when you hear that word trafficked, you don't have to pick up a child and move her to another place. You just have to simply make her available and sell her for sex. 
But what I want you to realize is that while we see a lot of icebergs out here, do we really take note of what happens underneath? Because if we really understood the journey about how they get to the top and how it looks at the top, we can't get there without understanding the mass that's below the water, all the things that we don't see, all the things that we don't know, because it's very easy to label a victim with the word prostitute. But when you hear that word prostitute, it doesn't make you think of a child who's in need of help. It makes you think of an adult woman who's making a decision. So language is absolutely key to prevention because one of the things that we have to recognize is that before they even get there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that has happened that we didn't even know about. Now I want to give you some of those things. When you look at this diagram, you can see a lot of different cultural factors. And I want to give you guys one, one analogy because while we all sit in this room and we think it's not close to us, we have to recognize that if you're not part of the solution, you get where I'm going? <laughs> Didn't want to say it. But if you look at some of these things, why is it that I go to a talk and yet we constantly hear people to say, oh my god, I didn't know this was happening. What can I do? How did this happen? Well, how, why are we shocked? We live in a culture now where it's OK and people are taught. As a young boy, when you go up, there is a certain rite of passage that as a man, you get to do certain things. We live in a culture when you turn on the television, normal clothes aren't normal clothes anymore. I talk to the girls all the time in my group, and, and I have to dispel the fact that some of their parents think that because they choose to wear a skirt or shorts this big, that that means they ask for it. Well, I really want to recognize that when you go into Walmart, Abercrombie and Finch, Gap, they don't make shorts like that anymore for any age. No one makes the long clothes anymore, so we have to look at what's available for young people to wear and then turn that into why that they're overly sexualized to begin with. Because again, we live in a culture that where young girls look like me. When I was 13, I didn't look like this. I love to blame it on the food. Maybe it's what's in the McDonald's, maybe it's what's in the chicken. I don't know, I don't get it. But, but just because you, you have 14-year-old girls who look like me now, it does not mean that they're adults. But yet, we have girls who look like this, and they are made to be, they are looked at by adult men. They are made to act adult. And I tell my girls all the time that just because you look the way that you look, and yes, you are beautiful, you are never fine enough for a 30 year old man. You just ain't that fine. I'm sorry, nobody is that beautiful at 13 years old that a 27 year old thinks that you're hot enough to be with them. And I want you to take away the picture of the pimp in your mind, because I also tell those same young girls that you're not that cool that a 30-year-old woman wants to be your bestie. Doesn't work out like that. There's not supposed to be unequal dynamics. So we're, I want you to look at some of these things, because some of the things is what, what creates the very vulnerability of our children. And when children are vulnerable, and when we have a society that allows it to be possible that you can purchase someone for sex, that is why we have the problem. But again, I ask, why are we shocked when these are the factors that are OK in our community? We have a continuum of sexual abuse that we live by at Youth Spark, and one of them is recognizing that nobody wakes up at 16 and chooses to be a prostitute. But you have to understand that somewhere along the way, somewhere in their growth, that they begin to link love with sex and abuse instead of think linking love with family and friends. You don't just wake up one day and decide, I'm going to be a prostitute. There is a journey. With most of the girls and boys involved in this having a history of sexual abuse, someone has already violated their boundaries. Someone has already taken advantage of their, sp their space. And when you're a young person, you're taught to tell adults. But what happens when you tell adults and adults don't believe you? Now as a child, you're making adult decisions on, do I believe what they say or do I not believe what they say? So again, I ask, when we hear about child sex trafficking, why are we shocked? Now. Again, there's a layer of guilt and shame that comes with any type of sexual abuse heightened in, when you are a child. When you should not be shamed for anything, you should have a thriving self-worth. Now take a look at this as well, because as we're going to the journey, we're now moving from child sexual ab abuse into the sexual exploitation of children with no commercial aspect yet. The sexual exploitation of children is absolutely what makes young girls and young boys vulnerable, specifically young girls. But just, just because you look like an adult doesn't mean you are. Just because your mother is not parenting you in the correct way doesn't mean that you are an adult making your own decisions. I have heard testimonies from pimps who say that I will talk to your child longer than you will. 
everybody who has a child doesn't know how to parent them. So we can't make, for whatever reason, we can't say that you should have to do certain things. Because instead of a child worried about stable housing, some of them have become runaway. We know within the first 48 hours of a child running away from home, one in three will be lured into prostitution. Who runs away from home for no reason? I did when I was 10, but everybody knew where I was, and I was the only one who didn't know it. Everybody was waiting on me to come home. But there are children today who are allowed to self-parent because no one ever calls and reports that child missing. They assume that that's what that child wants. Again, no one wakes up and just chooses to be a prostitute. There is a journey that they travel. And then after you've traveled that journey from sexual abuse, from, from sexual exploitation, then you get here. And we wonder why we have a problem of child sex trafficking. Look at the unequal dynamic power dynamics with the adult-child relationship. As I just said before, no 14-year-old is beautiful enough for a 32-year-old man. I don't care how much makeup you wear. I don't care how, how, how much you self-parented and how old you feel. You cannot be beautiful enough that an adult man will want to violate you and use you as a commodity. Now, again, the media influence is something that is very big. Once again, when you turn on that music, if you are not aware of what that music is pouring into your children, how can you prevent them from being vulnerable? On all the music, that, the lyrics that you hear, it's promoting this culture that it's totally OK to get money. And we program and teach our girls from a young age to get a good man. And what is a good man? A good man is someone who can provide. Who can provide at those teenage years? A grown man. Are we teaching our children what is a good husband, what is a good helpmate, or are we simply teaching them to be, to get a good man? And again, I ask, why are we shocked that we have this problem? Again, we live in a culture to where you can sit in your basement and you can order up online whatever kind of kid you want, and there are certain websites out here that promote it, even though that they don't own that, that promotion. They do promote it, and we know, I know, from fact and seeing it, that there are young girls who are uploaded onto sites and are advertised for sex, and there are people who are already willing, ready, and able to pay for them. If we did not have the demand for the product, the supply would go down. What we have to do now and address is that we can take all of this and we can turn it around, but we have to use the supply and demand model. You cannot talk about trafficking if you only want to talk about the victims. You have to talk about the men who perpetuate them. And so now when I talk about prevention is key, what does that truly mean? Prevention is the best protection. Let's not wait until we have to rescue them. Let's everybody, each one can reach one and talk to the teens in your life because if we get them on our team first, when the pimp walks up to them and says, hey baby, you look good, she will already know. And understand what it is. She will recognize that this is not what it's supposed to be. People have oftentimes told me that you can talk until the cows come home, but you will not end this problem. With me understanding prevention the way that I do now, I disagree. Because as a little girl, I sat there and I asked questions of my grandmother about slavery. It is my hope that one day, when I have children, that I am able to see my grandchildren and that those grandchildren will say to me, Mommy, Grandmommy, can you tell me that back in the day you used to work for an agency that helps young girls who could be bought and sold? That is what I will do because I do not drink out of a different water fountain. I do not sit at the back of the bus, and I feel that in a few short times, if we reach down and teach young boys that they do not have to grow up in the world and become a buyer, and we teach them to be on the same playing field, in about 12 to 15 years, we will see the fruits of our prevention, and we will be on that. So I end with this quote by Nelson Mandela that says, to be free is not merely to be cast of one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of everybody. So we are all free but do we live in a way that enhances the freedoms of others? Thank you.